Okay, so uh, I don't have a paper copy of this, so I'm just going to read it out loud. It says a flat is attached to the end of a blade on a windmill at the blade's lowest point. The full height of the windmill is 12 meters, and the blades are uh, three meters long. Okay, and the blade completes three rotations per minute, and it says determine the times that the flag is at least 10 meters above the ground in the first minute. Okay. So here we're going to have to come up with a model and then we're going to have to solve the problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a diagram here. Okay. So I've got some windmill and, you know, uh, whatever I've got. Okay. So there's my total height of the windmill. They tell me it's 12 meters and the blade is three meters okay so you have to think that um a flag is being put on the edge of the windmill so the flag is going to be going around this circle here okay so from here we see that the maximum height of the flag is going to be obviously the 12 when it's at the very top okay and the minimum height is when it's at the bottom so if one blade is three meters this is going to be six meters so it's going to be six meters off the ground at its lowest point okay and so from here we can determine our a value 12 minus 6 divided by 2 okay so that gives us three and then our c value is 12 plus 6 divided by 2 okay what is that 18 divided by 2 is 9 okay so we've got that information and now we can look at the period, which is uh, tells us that it rotates uh, three rotations per minute. So three rotations per minute. So I need to know how much one rotation takes. So one rotation is going to be either one third of a minute or I don't remember how I solved it. I think I probably solved this, that I did this as 20 seconds, okay? And it doesn't really matter which of the two you use. Since it doesn't, I'm just checking the question again. It does not specify, okay? And since I'm only looking within the first minute, I don't know, to me, I think I feel like working in seconds would be a little nicer, okay? But again, there would be absolutely no issue doing this question working in minutes okay and they're telling us that we're putting the flag on at the blade's lowest point so we know we're not going to need a phase shift so here you know the height with respect to time is going to be given by so what did we say our a value is three okay but we're going to use negative cosine because we're starting at the minimum point okay and so here, uh, oh, we have our uh, period. Of course, we have to find our K value. So our K value is going to be 2 pi over the period, which if I use 20 seconds, so that's going to be pi over 10. But obviously, if I was working in minutes, I would just do uh, 2 pi over one third. Okay, and I'd get a different K value, but it'll be measuring a different um using a different time unit okay like i said either way is perfectly fine unless it's specified okay and so what do we have t and then what did we see c was equal to nine okay and this is kind of the the the, the strategy you go through uh in order to uh solve uh for the model okay any questions on that before i move on to the next part No. Okay. So here it says, uh, determine the times uh, that the flag is at least 10 meters above the ground in the first minute. Okay. So in other words, we're going to be solving an inequality here, but I'm going to use the same strategy uh, that we used for uh, uh, polynomial equations, uh, sorry, polynomial inequalities. I'm going to determine when it's equal to that value and then use a graph to determine when it's uh, greater or less than the particular number I'm interested in, okay? And when we were solving polynomial inequalities, we would always make sure we were solving when it was equal to zero, because then it was very easy 
to determine when it's uh, positive or negative. Here, we don't need to necessarily make it equal to zero because our graph will easily tell us uh, at which points it's above 10 meters, okay? So the first thing we have to do here is we're gonna solve for the height being equal to 10, okay? So 10 is equal to negative three cos pi over 10 t plus nine, okay? So let me get my calculator ready and make sure it's in radians. No, it's in degrees. So there we go. Make sure you're checking that right at the start of the exam tomorrow. Okay, and please check my algebra. As soon as you see anything, just get on the mic and stop me right away because I'm not going to be able to see the chat. All right? So here we have uh, 10 minus 9 is 1. So negative 1 third is equal to cos of pi over 10 t. Okay, and because negative one third is not a nice uh, trig ratio, I'm going to have to solve this using cos inverse. And of course, we're going to remember that there's infinitely many angles that have a cosine of negative one third. Inverse cosine is going to give me only one of them. Okay, so to find our first possible value, I'll take cos inverse of negative one third. And that gives us 1.91. I think it's set to two decimal places. So we'll go to two decimal places. Okay. But of course, I know I can add 2 pi n to get other values. Okay. And then in order to find the second possible one in the first turnaround, because it's cosine, I know the related angle uh, identity that I'm going to use, and you can check on the um, trig identities that will be available to you. Here, we're going to do 2 pi minus 1.91. So the other angle, so here, let's subtract 2 pi. That'll give us 4.37 plus 2 pi n, okay? And now I can solve for t, okay? So here, let's do... 1.91, so here we're gonna do uh, times 10 and then divided by pi, and that gives us uh, 6.08. Now here, I can divide out my, you know, two pi divided by pi over 10, okay, which gives us 20, but we should have actually already known that because we know that this, function here, because we chose to work with 20 seconds, is going to repeat every 20 units, okay? So here, what do we have? We have 4.37, so uh, 4.37 times 10 divided by pi, and that gives us 13.91. Okay, so here, plus uh, 2 pi n. Uh, sorry, plus 20 in. Okay, any issues at this point here? So these represent all the values where it's equal to 10 meters, but now I'm going to use a graph to determine when it's, uh, here it says at least 10 meters, so that tells us we're going to include 10, okay? And again, you could find a bunch of these first, or you can just start graphing, and you know that you're starting from negative uh, starting from its negative cosine, so you're starting from the minimum. So, you know, one, two, three, and, you know, you kind of draw as many as you like. And here, somewhere there, you've got 10. So we can see that in between the first and second values that we have here, it's going to be greater than 10. Then between, you know, this the third and fourth, it's going to be 10. So essentially now I just have to go. So I know these first two. This first two is going to be 6.08 and 13.91. Okay. So here T, you know, in seconds. Okay. Since I chose to work in seconds is going to be that first interval is going to be 6.08 to 13.91. Okay. And then the next one is going to be between the next two times that it's equal to 10. So it's going to be 6.08 plus 20. We can do that in our heads. So 26.08. Okay. And here, this is going to be, uh, I guess, plus uh, 20 is going to be 33.91. 
Okay. Union, now let's go to the next two. So here, what do we have? 26 plus 20 is going to be 46.082. Let's see if we add 20, are we still going to be within our range? Yes, because this is just going to be 53.91. But then if I go to the next one, where it is at 10 meters, 20, where is it? 46 plus 20, 66. I'm already going to be beyond uh, my uh, values because it says in the first minute. All right. And so this would be our final answer. So step one, use the information given. You know, diagram is always useful to come up with the model. Okay. Then determine when it's equal to the value of interest. Okay. Find all the possible solutions and then use a graph to determine which uh, intervals you're taking. Okay, I uh, got a couple of hands up. So let's see, we've got Elliot and then we got Mitchell. Hello, um, I was just wondering what you do if the second value is out of the bound. So let's say that the 53 was like a 62. Yeah. Uh, how, would I, how would I write that? So then you would stop it at 60. Okay, so that's why we have to check. So let's say you're right. Let's say this was 46.8 and the next one was 63.91. Well, then I would stop this at 60 and then end it there because it's still above 10, right? It's only going to come down below 10 after 63.91. So up until 60, it's above the, um, uh, uh, it's above 10 meters. Okay, does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, and Mitchell? Um, I just wanted to ask if it's, like, if it's allowed to, if you're really allowed to do the subtraction after, like instead of doing uh, like two pi minus uh, 1.9, uh, can you just do it after once you have it, like 20 minus 6.008? Yeah, that does work. That's an alternate. So where you have to be careful with that method of doing it is if there's ever a phase shift okay when there's a phase shift you has to all you have to also account for the phase shift if you do it afterwards and that's my reasoning for following this method uh when there's no phase shift there you never have that issue okay so that's just one of those things where uh you know or for example if you were working with a sine function you wouldn't be doing uh you know, you wouldn't be doing uh, uh, 20 minus 6.08. You would be doing 10 minus 6.08 because it's pi minus the angle, right? So you'd have to take half. So there's just more thinking involved. So it's not incorrect. Just make sure you don't get caught, you know, uh, uh, not doing all that thinking process that's involved, okay? So this is kind of like the, the, um, the way of doing it where you don't have to think at all. You're just following your knowledge of angles. You find the first angle, you do two pi minus the second angle or pi minus the, the, that angle if it's for sine, and then the algebra takes care of all the work for you. So it's not incorrect, just you know, make sure you're not making any silly mistakes. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Grace, go ahead. Okay, so for the bottom line, when you have to like show like when it like it's acceptable and when it's not acceptable, mm -hmm. we use a range where it's like x is smaller than or equal to or like larger than or equal to. Do we use or? And then for the set notations with the brackets, we use u. Yeah, so you would use or because obviously you can't be in both sets at the same time. So if you used and, it's implying, oh, it has to be in this set and in that set, which, of course, no number can be in both. So if you're using set notation with uh, the inequalities in between, you would be using the word or. That's correct. Okay. Whereas here, when you're using interval notation, these themselves are sets. And so union is like the version of or in this scenario. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, anything else on this question here? No, okay, so let's move on. So I might as well stick with trig here. So there were some questions on the uh, review quiz. And like I said, question one was different. Uh, 
So if you look at the, the solutions, somebody noticed that the solutions were didn't match the uh, didn't match the question. Okay, so let's take a look then at. So we're going to start with question one on review quiz two. So this is going to be review quiz two, and this is number one. Okay, and somebody else had also asked about um, about uh, um, uh, angular velocity. So this is a question on angular velocity. Okay, so again, I don't have a printed version of this, and I don't want to have to show the other screen, so I'll just read it out. It says, Neptune's moon Triton has an orbit which is practically circular and completes a revolution in approximately 141 hours. Approximate Triton's angular velocity in radians per second, okay? So the idea of angular velocity essentially is telling you how quickly something moves around a circle, okay? So the most common way in which people are used to thinking about this is the idea of rotations or revolutions per minute, like you have on the, um, I guess, what is that? Not the speedometer, maybe the tachometer on your car, where it shows, you know, thousands of rotations per minute, okay? And that's kind of the more standard uh, uh, layperson's view of uh rotational velocity so how many times something goes around the circle with in a particular time value so whether it's rotations per minute rotations per second okay another way of describing the speed of this rotational moment uh, uh, movement is to talk about the angle that is produced per unit time so you think of the angle that's produced per unit time again it's a similar type of description. You're talking about how quickly something is moving around in a circle, okay? And that's the one that if you're actually, you know, doing high-level calculations regarding rotational motion, you're going to be working in uh, what, you know, in radians per unit time, and usually radians per second, okay? So if we look at here, as they give us the uh, speed of the rotational motion in revolutions per hour. So they tell us that it makes one revolution in 141, whoops, 41 hours. Okay, this is how they're describing the speed of the rotation. Okay, and what you could do is you could determine how many revolutions in one hour or how many revolutions in one second. But what they want it is in the more standard form, which is angular velocity, so using an angle. So you want to turn this eventually, you want revolutions over time, and you want to turn that into uh, radians per unit time, okay? And the, you know, sort of the hint there, even though they say, you know, angular speed or angular velocity is in this question here, they say in radians per second. So they're giving you the hint that you have to convert this uh, set of units into radians per, in this case, your second, okay? So what you need to know is what is the uh, conversion between a revolution or rotation uh, to radians? And we know that every revolution has two pi radians, okay? So that's the first thing you can do is replace one revolution by its description in radians. Okay, so here, if it was three revolutions in this amount of time, you would do three times two pi because each revolution is two pi radians. And then here, the other thing we have to do is convert hours into seconds, okay? And so this is where you say, well, okay, 141 hours. Well, each hour has 60 minutes and each minute has 60 seconds. So that means I would have to multiply 141 times 60 times 60, which is 3,600, okay? And this is now is in seconds. So all I've done is I've turned revolutions into radians, hours into seconds, okay? If I had to go the other direction, if I had to go from radians to revolutions, I would just be dividing by two pi. Here, if I was going by seconds to hours, I would just be dividing by 3,600, okay? 
And so now we can clean this up. Uh, and in fact, I think it says approximate. So you know what? I'm not even going to bother. Uh, not even going to bother simplifying. I'm just going to stick it in my calculator since it was looking for an approximation. Okay, so we got two pi divided by, and then what do we have? One for one times, whoops, 60 times 60. Okay, and that gives us, well, lots of zeros. So here, 0. 0.0000, you know, I'll take three of them, one, two, four radians per second. Okay, now it shouldn't be surprising that it's a very small angle in one second since going all the way around two pi radians takes so long. So we shouldn't be surprised with that small number. Okay, so I'm not sure who had asked about angular velocity. Uh, do we have any questions on that? All good, thank you, John. We're good, all right, good. Anybody else? Uh, I have a question if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do we know um, to put the revolutions on the top and then the hours on the bottom? Well, in the end, anytime you're given a um, uh, sort of a ratio or a rate that's going to be converted, you have to keep the similar uh, uh, similar units in the in the same order. So here, since they want it in radians per second, we know we need the time unit in the denominator. Okay, if they had been asking how many seconds per radian meaning the time unit in the numerator and the angle in the denominator, then you would have flipped these around, okay? So it's because they specifically tell us, you know, so angular speed, first of all, and velocity, whichever one you want to use. For us, for now, that's going to be interchangeable. It's always given as an angle per unit time, but here they actually told us radians per second, so we know the time unit has to be in the denominator. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, anything else on this one? No, okay, so let's go to, I think, 6B, okay? And uh, I guess we'll have to do 6A in order to do 6B. Okay, so this is review quiz two, number six. So this is similar to the one we solved before, except now it looks like the second question is not uh, is not. Um, uh, sorry, what am I trying to say here? Isn't an inequality? It's just an equation. So here it says a spring with a cube at the end is attached to the wall. Cubes minimum maximum distance from the wall are four and twenty centimeters, respectfully. So here, or respectively, so min is equal to four max is equal to 20. So that means our A value is 20 minus four divided by two. So what is that? 16 divided by two is eight. Again, please make sure you're checking all my work here. And the C value is 20 plus four divided by two, so 12. And then what else do they give us here? They give us the, um, the period is 1.5 seconds, so three over two. I'm just gonna put it in not that I need to, but I'll put it in a fractional form just to make the uh, uh, getting the uh, K value a little easier. So that means K is going to be equal to two pi over three over two, which of course is two pi times two thirds. Okay. And so that's four pi over three. Okay. Uh, and they're telling us write an equation for the distance of the cube from the wall with respect to time, starting at the maximum distance from the wall. So again, we won't need a phase shift here because as our parent, we can just use y equals cos x since we're starting from the maximum. Okay. So now here, let's get our equation going. I'll just use y and x here. So technically, since they're asking me for an equation, we should be you know, specifying that Y is gonna represent the distance from the wall, X is gonna represent the time in seconds. I won't write that out, but just as, a, as an aside that you should be specifying that. So what do we have here? We have eight cosine of four pi over three, uh, X plus 12. Okay, and there's our model. 
And now specifically, they want to know when this is 10 centimeters away. So I'm solving this equation. Okay, and so now let's just go ahead and do that. So we've got 10 minus 12 is negative 2 over 8 equals cos of 4 pi over 3x. And again, negative 1 fourth is not a special ratio, so I'm not going to uh, work with exact answers, although it's a context question, so I wouldn't be looking for exact answers anyway. So 4 pi over 3x is equal to, so again, let's do cos inverse of negative 2 over 8 is 1.8 by the way, in my head, I should be thinking, does this make sense? Oh, I'm taking cos inverse of a negative number, and 1.82 is in the second quadrant, so that makes sense, plus 2 pi n. And then here uh, we have, I'm just going to subtract 2 pi because it's cos, so 4.46. Okay, and 4.46 is uh, in the uh, third quadrant, okay, because it's less than 4.5, which would, is about 3 pi over 2. Uh, and so this makes sense that it should, the other one should be in the first quadrant, okay, 2 pi n. And so now x is equal to, so let's start 1.82 times 3 divided by 4 pi. Make sure you put that in brackets. So 0 0.43 plus, and now again, I should know that this period that I'm going to be adding is going to be, you know, one and a half. But let's just check, you know, just for the fun of it, you know, 2 pi, 2 pi divided by 4 pi divided by 3. And there you go, 1.5 exactly as I should expect. And here we have 4.46 times 3 divided by 4 pi, 1.06. Okay, and since here I'm only interested in when it's exactly equal to 10, I don't need to worry about determining greater than or less than. So here, x in seconds, we should specify that is going to be equal to, well, 0 0.43, 1.06. And now let's start adding 1.5 to these things here. Uh, there you go. It's, well, here, let's just do 0 0.43 plus, whoops, 1.5 is 1.93. And then 1.06 plus, I guess I should be doing this all at once, but that's fine, 1.5, 2.56. And I forgot, how long do we have to go for? Uh, the first five seconds. So we've got a few to go. So you know what? I'm going to try to save myself a little bit of time. Let's add a plus 1.5. Okay, so 4.06. I'll leave a spot there for the other one. And I'm not going to go any further with this group of numbers because if I add 1.5, I'm going to be beyond. So let's just find that other one. Uh, 1.93 plus 1.5 is 3.43. And let's see if I'm going to include the next one plus 1.5. And yes, I will. So the last one is 4.93. And there's all my answers. Okay. So again, very similar to that one. You know, I know a lot of the tutors don't like this method of doing things, but it just so happens that I'm giving you really nice ones, A, that use cosine instead of sine, that don't have any phase shifts, that make sure if you have to deal with phase shifts, that using that other method, you uh, do so with care, okay? Otherwise, you will get a bunch of wrong answers. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, Tony, why is it easier to have cosine instead of sine there? Oh, just because you're starting at the maximum, you know, so means no phase shift. Like for me, anytime I can avoid a phase shift, I'm very happy to avoid it.
okay? Because they specifically say that uh, you're starting at the maximum distance from the wall. So you could certainly use sign, absolutely no issue with using sign. It's just, I would say, easier to work with cosine since it starts at the max. Make sense? Oh yeah, I just thought you were saying that in general, it's easier to solve it if it's cosine, like regardless of what the question oh. is. Oh, just because here, you know, when you're finding your second answer, you're doing two pi minus this value. Whereas if you're working with this value directly, you would be doing 1.5 minus 0.43, which would give you, you know, 1.06, or I guess 1.07 there. It's a little, it's because of our um, uh, approximations that we made. Whereas if you were working with a sine function, you wouldn't be doing the full period minus 0.43 to get that other value. You would have to do half the period minus this value to get your second answer because it's pi minus the angle. Pi uh, represents only half the period. So again, things you have to think about. Perfectly doable, but you know more thinking involved. This way here, you know, a wee bit more writing, but no thinking involved. So that's my reasoning there. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything on this question here that we want to ask? Like I said, the other method, perfectly fine to solve that way. Anything else? No? Okay. So I believe the next question I had was from test one. So I think I have it here somewhere. So here, let me get a new sheet of paper. Now, depending on which test you wrote, this question may or may not be the same. So uh, if you wrote the other test, well, you're seeing a slightly different question. So here, this is a test one. I think this is version one. Uh, number, this is what application or thinking? Thinking number two. Okay. So let me read out the question. It says an open top cookie box is made by cutting off equal squares of the corners of a 30 by 20 centimeter rectangle. And then folding up the sides, the box should have a volume of 832 and not be higher than five centimeters determine the possible dimensions for the box. All right, so here, yeah, let's draw ourselves a little diagram. So we've got rectangle and what we're doing here. So this is 30, this is 20, and we're cutting out equal squares from each corner. And then we're gonna fold up each of those tabs that are left over and come up with an open top box. Okay, so what they tell us is that the volume needs to be 832 uh, centimeters cubed, okay? So I know I'm gonna have to work with the volume formula, okay? And I know that the volume is given by 832. So what I'm gonna have to do is solve is come up with expressions that in the, for the length, width, and height of the resulting box. But of course, we want to do so in such a way that uh, we have only one variable in there because that's all we know how to solve, okay? So I know that the base of the box is going to be this rectangle here because all these tabs, you know, these are going and these tabs are going to be lifted up. And so I need a, a way to express the length of the box, the width of the box, and the height when I fold it over. And the one thing we don't know is how much of a square is being cut off, okay? But I do know that the squares are all the same. And I know that the because it's a square, the um, uh, length and width are the same. So this is the one thing I don't know. So that's why, you know, we call that X, and that's also going to be X. So this should be enough to uh, come up with an expression for length, width, and height. So the length is going to be, well, the total is 30, and I'm cutting off these two 
um, lengths of x. So this is going to be 30 minus 2x. Similarly here, the whole thing is 20, and I'm cutting off an x here and an x there. So this is going to be 20 minus 2x. And then, of course, what is being lifted up? Just that flap, which has a length of exactly x. So this is going to be the height of the um, uh, box. So here, what I have is I have a, an expression for the length, width, and height, all using the same variable. Okay, And lo and behold, that's a uh, polynomial equation. Okay, but of course, in order to solve a polynomial equation, I've got to, you know, distribute, bring everything to one side, get zero in order to use factoring in a useful sort of way. Okay, so just for, I'm just going to write that on the other side, the 832 on the, on the, the right hand side for now, but let's just do this carefully here. So we've got 30, so that's 600. Here we've got negative 60. Uh, sorry, negative 60 minus 40, so minus 100x, and then we've got plus 4x squared times x equals whoop, 832. Okay, make sure you're checking my arithmetic as we go along. So I'll distribute the x, so we have 4x cubed, and this is going to be minus 100x squared uh, plus 600x, and I'll bring the 832 to the other side. Okay. And so I've got a cubic equation. Now it's looking pretty good that these are likely all divisible by four. I see, oh yeah, this one's also going to be divisible by four, so I might as well divide four to both sides of the equation. Okay. Or factor out four and divide it to both sides of the equation, however you want to look at it, okay? But in the end, if I factor out a 4, I'm left with just x cubed minus 25x squared plus, uh, I guess this is what, 150x, and then here minus, divide by 4 is 2, uh, 0, and 8. Everybody confirm that? I know that's right, but... You know what? I don't want to make a silly mistake, so I'm going to confirm all these things. There you go, 832 divided by 4. There we go, all good, but, you know, this is not the time to... So even for you on a test, that's not the time to take any chances, all right? So I'm looking at this here. looks pretty clear that grouping is not going to work, so I guess we're going to have to start using the factor theorem. Okay, because I want to show my work, I'm going to give this a name. I'll call this f at x. So let me start f at 1. Okay, so here let me try to get it so you can see it. So, you know, 1 minus 25 plus 150 minus 208. No, not equal to 0. Okay. Now, normally, and actually I should be checking negative one, because even though negative one obviously is not an answer that I'd be interested in, maybe one of the resulting ones, you know, that, uh, you know, when I, when I divide and get my quadratic, so I still should check negative one. So negative one cubed is negative one, and this is going to be minus 25, because it's negative one squared, then it's going to be nine, minus 150. Okay, and minus 208, that's not going to look, that didn't look too, uh, too promising. Okay, so negative one doesn't work. Let's try, let's try two. So here we've got two cubed is eight, minus 25 times four. Okay, then we have plus 150 times two. Okay, minus 208, look at that. We hit pay dirt pretty quickly. Okay, so f at 1 wasn't equal to 0, f at negative 1 wasn't equal to 0, but f at 2 is equal to 0. Notice how I'm doing all this work on the side. I don't want to mess up my nice work on the right. Okay, so I know that x minus 2 is one of my factors, 
Notice how I write it down right away so I don't forget to write it. That's a very common mistake where people just forget about the first factor. Uh, they don't bother ever writing it down and then it disappears. Okay, so I'm gonna write it down. So now let me divide here. So one, negative 25, 150, negative 208 divided by X minus two, which is represented by two. So here we have one and then here we have two and then negative 25. So it's negative 23. And then this is negative 46. And at this point here, I got lots more work to do. So I'm not taking any chances. 150 minus 46. Okay, 104. And then two times 104 is 208. And when I add, there we go, I get my zero. Okay, so worked out nicely. So here I'm left with X squared minus 23x plus 104, and then that's equal to zero, okay? And I am kind of tempted to try to, um, to see if I can factor this, you know, let me play around with 104. I know that's divisible by four. 26 and four is not gonna help me get 23. But let's see, what else might this be? Uh, you know, 104, is that divisible by eight? There you go. And eight and 13, hey, that, oh no, does not add up to, uh, does not add up to uh, 23. So uh, eh, maybe it won't work. Anyways, I'm sure I figure, I feel there is a factorization here, but these numbers, instead of spending too much time, let me calculate. So here X is equal to two. X is equal to 23 plus or minus square root of 23 squared minus four times one. So 104 all over two. And let's see what those things are equal to because there's nothing that says we have only one answer here. Again, make sure you're checking my arithmetic here as I do it. I don't miswrite anything. 23 plus square root of 23 squared minus four times 104 divided by two. Oh, good thing I didn't keep, um, I didn't keep uh, trying to factor because it looks like it doesn't work. Or in here, 23 minus square root of 23 squared minus four times 104 divided by two. So again, notice there are two other possible answers, okay? But both of these are, would represent a height larger than five. So that's why in the end, there's only gonna be the one answer, okay? So it is important to check because it could be that there's other answers, more than one possibility, but it looks like here, it's the only possibility. So here, the dimensions are gonna have to be that the length, which was 30 minus two X, well, X, I'll put that in, was equal to, what did we find? Two, okay. So 30 minus four is 26 centimeters. The width was 20 minus two times X. So here, 20 minus four is 16 centimeters. And then the height is just equal to two centimeters, okay. So quite a long problem, certainly involved. You know, you might want to ask yourself, you know, will you likely get such an involved problem, you know, on a, on an exam, but certainly, you know, we saw how we could apply our strategies for solving polynomial equations when sort of traditional factoring methods don't work. All right. So I don't remember who asked for this one here. Uh, any questions on this or from anybody else? No, nope. okay. Uh, I'm just gonna check quickly in the chat. I don't see anything new. Is there anything else people wanna ask about in terms of questions? Are there any other questions we wanna look at? Okay, so since there's no more sort of questions, I'm gonna stop the recording.